Thank you, Lisa, and it's so good to be here. I am uh, really thankful and honored uh, when Matt reached out to me. Um, you know, I was a little nervous when he first asked, but um, it was almost an immediate yes. I was very excited uh, to be able to be here uh, today with you. I uh, think of you all often. I actually have a kind of a special place in my heart for this church. For, wh for whatever reason, it's true, and I actually pray for you um, often. So it would have been uh, the spring of 2003, um, and the South Central neighborhood uh, would have just been kind of waking up, if you will, um, from its winter slumber. And um, I suppose all neighborhoods are like this, really, right? So you really don't see folks for about three or four months. Um, and suddenly it's March or April, and that neighborhood kid, um, suddenly, you know, she's like 10 feet taller than what you saw her um, in December. Or maybe you finally meet somebody that moved in in December, and before you know it, they've already been your neighbor for a half a year, and you're just meeting them. Um, it would have been very similar for me. I had just moved into the neighborhood um, in February of that winter, and... Uh, for as long as I live, I'll never forget this specific spring day. I remember getting into my old burgundy Ford Taurus, and um, I lived on South Jefferson Street, still where I live, and um, I was turning on 9th, heading toward Walnut, um, and as I approached that intersection, I saw uh, this little boy right there at the corner of Ninth and Walnut, and um, I could tell, kind of from his posture and kind of the look in his eye, um, he was very intent to jet across Walnut Street. And if you're unfamiliar of that section of town or that section of the street, um, it is a four-lane road, two lanes north and south, and it can be fairly busy. Um, so I'm sure that we've all had these moments in your life when you're like, I have a really important decision to make in a very short amount of time, right? Um, and I remember my stomach hurting and not really not for sure what to do. So I go ahead and pull out onto North, uh, North on Walnut Street, and there's two commercial buildings on my right, and thankfully there's a parking lot in between them. So I just kind of pull in to there, and I walk, start walking toward this young boy. And I can tell he wants to ignore me, right? Um, but I make eye contact with him and um, his big brown eyes, and uh, I tell him, I say hi, and that my name is Joy. Um, he says his name is Nick and that he's four years old. And at this point, I notice his clothes are a little disheveled um, and his face is a bit dirty. Um, and I ask Nick why he's so intent of trying to cross this road. Um, and real quick like and very shy, he says, I'm going Jimmy Rex. And now he said this real fast and with a four-year-old lisp. Um, and I remember, um, and remember, I'm also new to, new to South Muncie, and so I have absolutely no idea what he just said. Um, and so I asked him to repeat himself, um, and he said, um, I'm going to Jimmy Rex, and this time he points. Um, and uh, I, I look down the street, when you look down South Walnut Street, there's this huge sign on the side of the building, it's like the heavens parted, and I realized, oh, um, Jimmy Rex, got it, okay, very good. Um, it's actually a place that he's trying to go to. Um, and I realize at this point um, that I have a decision to make. Do I help Nick cross the street? Uh, what if his dad's actually not there? Um, then what, right? So I talked to him for a little bit, and I realized that he actually only lives uh, four streets down, I mean, excuse me, four houses down from me, just around the corner, but still four street, uh, excuse me, four houses. And uh, I convinced him that maybe we should walk toward his house. And um, as I get a little bit further, I'm realizing that there is no one, there's no one there for me to drop him off to. So another decision to be make, and I start, I go ahead and decide to point him out where I live so he might feel more comfortable that I'm a neighbor and that I'm really not making that up, right? Um, so I kind of wonder, maybe he needs a drink of water, and before you know it, as it might with most four-year-olds, a drink of water turns into a bowl of ice cream, and we're standing in my kitchen, and I'll, I'll never forget, I sort of had this out-of-body experience. I remember um, the ice cream scoop in my hand, like, headed toward the mint chocolate chip ice cream, and anxiety just filled my body from head to toe, because I was like, oh my gosh, I've just kidnapped this kid. Like, I don't know him, and he's standing in my kitchen, and I'm like, Nick, we're going to go enjoy this outside, right? So we, I get him out of my house and, um, you know, have a conversation with the four-year-old as, as much as you can, and I decide, well, let's, let's see if we can see if anybody's home. And we turn the corner and start heading toward his house, and he says, Dad, 
and he starts running down the sidewalk, and I see a gentleman running, uh, excuse me, walking toward me. Um, and admittedly, my heart skips a little bit, a little bit of a beat, and I just quickly say, introduce myself, I'm a new neighbor, I point out where I, where I live, and I just said, it's nice to meet you, and uh, nice to meet your son, and I just keep going, right? Like, I don't want to have too much of a conversation. And I remember quietly whispering a prayer to God that day. I was walking to my car, and I said something like, God, what in the world was that? And for 20 years, I have not stopped whispering different versions of that prayer. God, what was that? God, what's really going on? God, I don't think I'm seeing the whole picture. Please help me see, and on and on and on. And I can tell you, friends, that that 24-year-old me had no idea. But meeting little Nick that day changed my life. And even though I would never have had this language then, it began a process in me of seeking shalom for my neighborhood and my city, and a process of God seeking shalom within me. And I'll circle back to Nick and his family in a bit, but let me take a minute to remind us where we are in the series and also just a, a few minutes of reintroducing myself. So again, as Lisa said, um, most of you probably know me as executive director of Urban Light Community Development. There might be some of you who've known me uh, all of these 20 years, but um, Urban Light CDC, Community Development Corporation, we are a faith-based nonprofit uh, working on the south side of Muncie. Um, and we do really operate on that neighborhood level context that you're really learning about uh, through Seeking Shalom and through what Dr. Sean Duncan talked about in terms of centering a neighborhood. And we might do that on a micro level, micro context, whether that be um, centering the women who are at the recovery home, the Lighthouse Recovery Home, which y'all uh, generously um, cared and loved for through your giving during the Lent season. We might do that, and again, on a micro level with our tenants and our affordable rentals, but we also do that on the macro level that you're probably learning more about having conversations in in your Seeking Shalom groups of, of, of systems and housing strategy and beautification and advocacy and make sure the voice of our neighbors and their goals, dreams, and concerns are at the center of our work. And we have primarily worked in two neighborhoods over these years. Uh, the South Central neighborhood where I live. Um, for the last 13, our organization was incorporated in 2010, and all of our affordable rentals, our housing renovation projects for home ownership, the Lighthouse, South Central Community Garden, neighborhood engagement work has been really centered there. But in the last four years, we have turned our neighborhood engagement work, we still do the things in South Central, but really turned any new initiatives into the industry neighborhood. Um, as well, and we will now also be turning our housing work there to really for the foreseeable future. We, we know that this work is long term. I often say it's generational. I, I um, sort of joke, but kind of not joking, that I, I really think I could probably retire working in the industry neighborhood. We I understand the long context of this work and the work that we do um, in being committed to that uh, longevity. Um, and, and again, I've had the honor of uh, being professionally paid to do this work for the last seven years, but if you do the math, I've been um, living and, and being among this context of the work for the last 20, so the majority of the time, I was a neighbor, um, working my professional life, um, simply being a neighbor in the South Central neighborhood, um, being single for the last first seven years, being married for the last 13, my daughter Emma is almost 10, so Really, you could say I became an adult, right? I grew up uh, doing this work um, in the South Central neighborhood. And another historical piece point that I felt amiss if I didn't mention um, is that um, not just urban like community development, but actually four total um, organizations or institutions or containers, if you will, were kind of birthed out of this work from 20 years ago. Um, so, of course, urban like community development as a nonprofit. Urban Light Church as a church institution, um, Inspire Academy as a charter school, and in and out cleaning services, in and out cleaning services as a for-profit business. All of these containers exist. All this holistic work of uh, listening to, being a, a partner in those experiencing mater material poverty or marginalized, um, historically marginalized neighborhoods. But I will say that all I can honestly say I know that all those folks, including myself. 
Uh, we're honored to be representatives and connected to those organizations, but at the heart of it, we are simply neighbors living out our lives and um, our families in historically marginalized areas. So here we are today, third week in the sermon series of Seeking Shalom. Um, and if you were able to be with us during the workshop with Dr. Sean Duncan, he did a great job of reminding us that the heart of this is centering the neighborhood. Um, and he gave five kind of principles, if you will, um, after the neighborhood is centered. Um, and then his Sunday sermon, he did a great job um, of talking about the whole big overarching biblical story of redemption that we're all connected to. Um, and then your pastor, Matt Carter, um, really did a great job. I, I listened in last week, um, a great teaching. And, and it's not an easy teaching about changing our posture toward this idea of crisis versus chronic, um, a development response to crisis versus chronic material poverty. And so today, I could do a little bit more of a deeper dive into some of that hands-on work, um, if you will, because um, I could really talk your ear off all day um, about the power of a safe, secure space like the Lighthouse Recovery Home for Women and what it means for women to be living next to an authentic relationship, not just with each other as residents, but as employees that are often, um, actually all of our employees right now have lived experiences walking through their own recovery and the power of that. Um, I could talk to you um, I get real excited and nerdy about housing and strategy and home ownership and uh, rental percentage of rental home to home ownership home. And I could tell, tell you, which might sound weird, but I feel like one of the most spiritual acts I do is provide safe, affordable rental housing to my neighbors. Um, or I could tell you how I personally come alive um, when I see our organization create, creating a space like the Industry Neighborhood Cookout where neighbors are connecting in a safe space with each other, with resources, and maybe, just maybe, creating a new narrative, even within themselves, about their neighborhood. But if you want to hear more about that, um, and I could talk to you for a long time about that, you'll have to ask me out for a good cup of coffee, because I actually felt today that God was asking me to hit the pause button in a way so that we could actually peel back what's happening inside of all of us, inside of me and inside of you, when we learn about such of these topics, when we're honest and vulnerable enough to engage in these conversations. And I am so, I feel honored that this body of church is in this series and working through these tough topics in your small groups to talk about the tough things, the response of chronic versus crisis poverty, the idea of proximity and relationships and authentic relationships, what some of us call a theology of place. And all of these topics are going to create some sort of resonance or resistance within us. They just will. And that's okay. And if I could remind you, if you could just think for a second, at the end of Dr. Sean Duncan's Sunday sermon, he had us stand up and he gave us one last encouragement um, before sending us off. And he asked us, to stay curious, changeable. So today I want us to explore this idea a little bit more of being curious. But before we do that, like why, right? Why is that, if you were, um, just a couple slides ago, he, he, he said center to neighborhood and then five principles and it was his third principle, um, be curious and be changeable. Why is that important? Well, we've used a lot of analogies probably already, even just a couple of weeks into the series of, of, of what uh, we call it, like changing our posture, right? So centering the neighborhood is changing our posture. The church is no longer in the center. We're centering others and listening, and their voice becomes uh, what drives the work, right? So we could say that full bucket, empty bucket, if you, if you heard Dr. Sean Duck and talk about that, uh, my bucket's full, your bucket's empty, I'm going to put into your bucket, end of story. The problem is that that's just creating a cycle that isn't working, right? Or we could talk about the analogy of a table where I'm here, somebody else is here, and I'm just, it's just one way giving instead of a mutual relationship between. So what can we do to center, uh, change those analogies and center um, those relationships, the mutual relationships. And so we can talk about all those analogies, but I'm confident today that Jesus actually wants us to think about what's behind that. And I, could we think about even changing the posture of our hearts? 
that he wants to guide us in developing and deepen a practice that helps us see what's inside of our heart as we posture ourselves toward others. And so what I want to offer us today is that we often, uh, that we need often, often need help seeing um, that we are reacting out of wounds and bias and personal experiences and assumption and lots of times a mixture of all of those things. So let's just take a moment even now, just to pause and be curious. Um, sometimes that word bias can even be a word that walls can go, can, can, can go up inside of us or our feathers can be ruffled. So just notice what's going on inside of you when I say that word. And you know, and, and I have a deep disdain, actually, if I have to admit, as a, as a parishioner, when pastors um, ask you to turn toward your neighbor and ask you, you know, turn to your neighbor and say blah, 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 right? Like, it drives me crazy. So I'm not going to do that to you today. But I have to admit that I was tempted to have you turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you have bias, um, because we all do. And so I'll say that for us today. We all have bias, and it's okay. We do. Um, This has been the case for human history. We are not unique or special in this. And we also don't get to walk away from it either. Um, So in a second, we're going to take a look at some biblical stories where folks are reacting and responding to Jesus through their own personal experiences, assumptions, and biases. But before I do that, I want to tell a story of context right here in Muncie, just to make sure we are explicitly all on the same page of exactly what I'm talking about. So I have a, um, a friend, that, a couple, um, they're now retired, uh, living on the west side of town, but when they were both working and early in their marriage, they lived on the south side of town, and actually both of them grew up on the south side of town, and he was relaying the story to me that um, just uh, like a normal conversation with one of his coworkers about like what you did over the weekend, right? It just happened to be the Christmas season, and he was sharing um, that, he, that they had put up the tree and put up the decorations and had wrapped the gifts um, and that, he, you know, he'd put the gifts under the Christmas tree and she stopped him. He, she said, wait, you, you, like, you leave your wrapped gifts out underneath your Christmas tree? And he's like, yeah. Like, she goes, aren't you worried that somebody's going to break into your house and, and take them, like steal them? And at that point, she actually didn't even know where he lived. So that was, that was just her reacting out of her fears, right? Um, and then she said, well, where do you live? And he said, well, he, you know, he said where he said and on the south side of town. And she said, oh, the numbered streets. Well, then I certainly wouldn't leave the, your, your wrapped gifts under the tree on, those, on the numbered streets. And obviously she was revealing, right, her own uh, assumptions or bias or whatever her personal experience or wound might have been tied to that. She was, it was becoming very explicit, right? Um, And so my friend tried his best to talk about how that affected him and what that meant for him, and it was a little offensive, but um, he he admittedly walked away from that situation not thinking that he had uh, changed her mind a bit on this, but what I want to point out is that it affected their relationship, right? It affected their relationship to be able to to continue on and have an authentic friendship if she would want to stay in that bias. So let's look at a few biblical stories um, and Jesus' response to these. So first, I'm going to just kind of read through them with, the, with, you, with all of us, and then we're going to circle back and kind of digest them kind of one by one. So the first one, John 4, 9. I'll wait for it to come up. There we go. You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Luke 9, 12. Let's send the crowds away. Mark 10, 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. John 4, 1, 46. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Luke 13, 14. There are six days in which work to be done. Come on those days to be healed. Luke 19, 7, he has gone to be the guest of notorious sinner, they grumbled. And maybe my favorite, Luke 9, 54, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? <laughs> and before we circle back to them, let's just pause for a second um, and really think through the posture of Jesus, actually. So when he was asked what was the greatest commandment, his response was to love the Lord your God with all your heart 
mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so it is not a stretch to say that Jesus' acts and his, all of his acts and words are drawing us back to these two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So let's go back in and look. I know it can give you a little clunky to, to flip back through, but let's look at John 4, 9. Just quickly, this is one of my actually favorite stories just because how, how lovely and tender Jesus is with this woman and all of her wounds connected to men. And he actually uh, gently points that all out and to the point where she's like, you, uh, she accepts that he's the living water and can't wait to tell her whole village about it, right? But, but before that beautiful part of the story, her first reaction is to put up a wall to him. And I would say that we often do that even to God and to to others around us. You are a Jew, I am a Samaritan. Why are you even talking with me? Luke 9, 12, this is actually from the feeding of the 5,000. I so identify with the disciples in this one. Like they're overwhelmed, right? They've been working hard all day. Jesus has been preaching. It's the end of the day. It's more than 5,000, right? We culturally know it's, it's many more than that. And they don't know what to do, right? They don't know what the right answer is. They don't know what their next step is. Like this, this issue is overwhelming. Trust me, in the last 20 years, I have identified with this. And their response is, let's just send the crowds away. Like, I totally empathize with that. <laughs> like, it's, sometimes it's just, we just want to hide and not actually do anything, right? React to that. And Jesus is like, no, let's, let's actually figure out a different way to do that. Mark 10, 13, of course, we can talk about culturally, maybe children don't have the, the voice that maybe they have today in our, in our culture. But really, I think that the heart of what's going on here with the disciples is that this is a waste of time, actually, right? Jesus is, it has so much more important things to do. Matter of fact, we have a new kingdom to set up, right? He can't stop and spend time with children, um, let alone um, actually praying and, and engaging with them, right? And again, Jesus is like, oh, actually, that posture of your heart actually needs to be turned a little bit. Actually, not only come to, have them come to me, but you have to be like children. John 1, 4, again, Nazareth. I think the only thing I have to say about that is it sounds a lot like numbered streets to me. And then Luke 13, 14, the Pharisees and Sadducees, this is them responding to Jesus healing somebody on the Sabbath And again, he's correcting their heart, their law, their structure, their institutions that they're putting up before the connection and healing of their brother. Luke 19, 7, of course, this is alluding, well, not of course, but just to let you know, it's alluding to Zacchaeus, right? And the reality is in this work, sometimes we're just not going to like the person. They didn't like Zacchaeus. They didn't like what he had done to them, and they had to work through all these things. They considered him a notorious sinner. They probably had a hard time actually seeing his redemption, and they had to work through that in their heart. Luke 9, 54, this is the the sons of thunder. Jesus named them, I think, appropriately. My guess is that this was not the only statement that they made like that. If you get a nickname, the sons of thunder, my guess is that you're saying things like calling down fire from heaven more than once. But again, he rebukes them and says, no, this isn't how we're going to treat somebody just because they disregarded, disregarded me. Um, we're actually going to come alongside and teach them a different way. And so I just want to be clear that Jesus' response in all of these scenarios, whether he's correcting, rebuking, whatever word you want to, what do you use, whether he's drawing out the truth from folks, this is not some like power flex of Jesus, like to be the, the one correcting or the one I'm going to show you the right way or some shame show for these folks to live in. And it's not the case for us either. Like, of course not, right? He actually draw these things out of us so that we can be healed. Whatever personal experiences or wounds or bias or assumptions that we bring to a table to bring to a relationship God's drawing that out of us so that we can be healed and more authentically love him, love others, and love ourselves. So let me circle back to Nick's family real quick. So uh, that's from that spring day to really that end of that summer in 2003, 
Um, at that point, um, some of you might know Josh and Lindsay Arthur. Josh and Lindsay and myself were the only ones that had moved into the South Central neighborhood shortly after that where there were different waves of folks moving in to do the work that we do. But really, the three of us, um, it's, it's not really an overstatement that we spent almost every day with Nick, um, his brother James, and their two older siblings, which happened to be twins, a boy and a girl. Um, loving them and playing with them and sidewalk chalk and bubbles and, uh, you know, popsicles and coming over for dinner and making dinner together, just living life and being a neighbor and loving on these kids and falling in love with them and slowly gaining just a little bit of trust with their parents. Um, as you might imagine, if the beginning of my story was about a four-year-old being left alone, there were some things going on in the family, right? Um, some, some, some tough things. And so we were working through those things and trying to build some authentic, real relationships and loving these kids um, almost every day. I remember later that summer, I was working on a part-time job at that point, and Josh and Lindsay came to my job, and which is kind of weird. They'd never, like, why come to my job in the middle of the workday, right? Um, and they wanted to tell me that, unfortunately, the night before, that somebody had broken into Nick's house um, and had tragically, uh, physically and sexually abused his older sister. And it was heart-wrenching, heart-wrenching to be in that pain with her, for her, uh, the injustice of it all, um, what that meant in terms of even us newly living into the neighborhood of safety and connection and neighborhoods. Um, but really what hurt the most, I'll say for me, is that they, most, they immediately left, understandably, right? They moved to, to a different neighborhood and we had a little bit of contact with them when they moved to the neighborhood and then they actually moved out of the county and we lost all contact with them. And, you know, it actually took a couple years for me. I didn't know this, it's something I hid in my heart. I was that for the next few years, um, I was really operating out of that wound um, and that I hadn't talked to God very much about it. Um, I talked about it praying for her and her family, but I hadn't talked about like what it had done in me. And my posture looked right, right? I was doing all, still doing all the same things. I was playing with kids and jump rope and whatever, right? Like do, being at the garden. Um, and so my posture and connection and conversation and digging into these things was all correct. Um, but God did slowly show me over the next couple of years how I was really keeping my neighbors and particularly children really at an arm's length and not having close, authentic relationships with them. And be very clear that I explicitly want to say that I am not comparing my wound to what she experienced. What I am saying is that I was allowing my wound to have authentic relationships than with the next neighbors. We're about seven years ago. Um, it would have been shortly after I became executive director and seems foolish now because I don't feel this way now, but when you have a new position, I don't know, like uh, you don't want to be a fool, right? <laughs> so like I'm more aware of things, right? When I'm professionally doing something maybe. Um, and it was a summer where um, it was actually just connecting. I was like, I'm not making this up, right? You know, things get a little blurry. But it was a summer where, um, it, I don't know, like our senses were really heightened. There just happened to be a lot of youth that were bored that summer, and they were just often congregating together, whether it might be 20 to 30 kids at a time. And um, as kids get bored, sometimes there were fights between them or uh, maybe a small amount of vandalism, nothing, nothing honestly very significant, and nothing that we're experiencing today with some of the gun violence. Um, in our neighborhood. Um, but it just happened to be one of those nights where there was probably about 10 youth on Jefferson Street. And if you're in my house where I live now, which is still the, kind of the same block, I just moved across the alley. Um, I can, you can see the South Central Community Garden from my living room when you look out the windows. And the youth were heading toward there. And um, now I consider, I had this foolish thought of like, I wonder if they're gonna vandalize something at the garden. And I remember immediately the Holy Spirit um, pricking my heart and asking me two questions. Would you be thinking that if that group of folks weren't teenagers, weren't youth? So he's revealing this distrust that I had uh, with youth. And he said also, would you be thinking that if most of them weren't black? And I had to really wrestle with that. Really had to be really honest with that. You know, I grew up in a really wonderful uh, Christian family, I'm, I am indebted to my mom and dad teaching me how to love the word of God and how to pray. 
Uh, but I also grew up with words, uh, racist words, language. And those are things that I still have to keep pulling out of me and being honest about and letting God reveal those things to me so I can have more authentic, real, honest relationships with my neighbors. And so where do we go from here? And so I would, I would offer that we go back to my 20-year-old question. God, I don't know what this is or what's happening, uh, but please help me see you more clearly. So I want to leave you with this, these two practices um, based out of Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Uh, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, O God. And so for this first one, I want to leave with you this little practice I've picked up along the way. It's actually just an acronym. Um, that I, I love. I, I, it's so simple. I feel like it's one of those things you can kind of like put it in your pocket, and it's one of those things that you can, if you can learn to connect with it and almost memorize it, you can even use it when you're standing in the grocery line, when you're at the public library, when you're um, engaging uh, with my neighbors at the South Central Community Garden or the industry cookout. It allows you just to slow down and to be curious. And so the first, in, the acronym is COLE, so the first one is curiosity, right? What's going on? What am I seeing? What am I feeling? What am I thinking? What's going on inside of me? Is my heart racing? Is my stomach hurt? Like just identifying, right? What do I see around me? Being open to hearing that, to knowing that, identifying that, seeing that, being honest with yourself, right? Accepting that it's there, like whatever it brings up, right? I had to accept the fact that I was operating out of a wound for multiple years and it was affecting my ability to care and love other people. I had to accept the Holy Spirit was showing me, Joy, you have a bias and, and assumptions about folks that, that is affecting you. It's a hindering you. It's, a, it's affecting your ability to love me, yourself, and others. And then love. I just want to, I want to say this so clearly. Um, this, is, again, goes back to the heart and love of Jesus. Uh, this is not, again, about power flex or a feeling shame or living in condemnation. This is about freedom, right? God points these things out so we can live freely and connect with others and with him and with ourselves. I think of Peter. Um, man, he, he did some things that he could have really lived in shame for the rest of his life. But older Peter, when writing First Peter, he reminds us that love covers a multitude of sins, right? That's where he wants us to land is in God's love. So the second practice, the honesty prayer I want to give you, um, you can actually use the QR code, but there are also um, printed out copies out on the cart in the lobby that you can take with you today. Um, but this is more of a practice that is, is not going to be so much in the moment. Um, you'll see if you, pick up one of the, if you pick up one of the papers, it's actually a journaling tool that you would take away with you um, in a quiet moment with God um, as maybe something's come up um, and you actually can't pinpoint it. You're like, I know this is here, but what's it connected to? Or how is it affecting me? And it's actually this ability to stop and really ask God to reveal and show you um, the different ways that it's affecting you. And so the step one really is that stop and ask. Like, God, what's really going on? When I do this or interact in this way, these things are coming up in front of me. And literally writing that down. Holy Spirit, I need your help. What's really going on with this, this, and this? Number two, getting honest. Really taking out your journal, spending some time quietly, and taking the risk of being vulnerable and writing whatever that honest prayer is. Like, just getting it out, right? Getting it out. Number three, reflecting. After taking that time, to be honest, like, reread it. Like, figure out, are there themes in it? Or is there a certain emotion that's coming up a lot of time? Are there certain um, relationships that are coming up in, in the prayer? What, what do you need to be curious about in your own honest prayer? And then number four, listen and exchange. It's that time where we do our best, right? When we really connect and we say, God, can, what do you have to say to me? And I would just say, like, just take the risk to write that down. Like, just kind of let go of the fact that you're, sometimes you know whether, is it my voice, is it the Holy Spirit's voice? Right? Just take the risk of writing down 
what do you think God is saying to you about your own honesty prayer? So I just want to leave us again with Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. Church, he, he loves us so much. He wants to show, these, show us these things. And as you're moving and working toward these things and seeking shalom, like I just want to encourage you one more time, like think about your posture and how you're, it, how you're uh, physically changing the systems and thinking about your response to material poverty or to marginalized neighborhoods, but also taking the time to pause and be curious of what's going on inside of you. So if you stand together, let's stand, let's stand together as I pray for us this morning. And I would just ask two, two encouragements, like don't, don't miss this moment. If there's anything even stirring up inside of you in this moment, um, there are people that are gonna be uh, in the corners at the, the lamps um, that will, of course, be ready to pray for you uh, for anything. But I would ask that you not miss this moment today. If there's something that God is even stirring inside of you in this moment, just to pray with a trusted brother and sister and say, hey, this is here, and I just want to be honest about it. My other encouragement is if you are part of a Seeking Shalom small group, man, don't, don't miss this chance to really have some honest conversations because the, the one risk is that we're just going to change the modality and not what's going inside of your heart. Uh, we need each other. As I've alluded, um, you know, I've not been doing this work for 20 years by myself. There are numbers of people that have intentionally decided to make this a style and a lifestyle of being in proximity in neighborhoods uh, experiencing material poverty, and we could have not have done this. Matter of fact, there are times when I have folks come to me, like, interested in this idea of um, uh, moving into a neighborhood. I'm like, well, who, who, who's doing it with you? Who are you connected with? And so I want to say you are connected with your Seeking Shalom groups, and this is a space where you can just be honest and connect with each other. There's power in that. So let's pray. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for every person here today. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you talk to us, that you guide us, that you're our counselor. Thank you that you give us wisdom. Thank you that you love us so much that you'll keep pursuing us to the point of revealing what might be keeping us from loving you, loving our neighbors, and loving ourselves. God, may you bless us today with eyes to see and ears to hear and wisdom to understand. God, I pray a blessing over all this, this whole church and these Seeking Shalom groups. I pray that this would be a space of vulnerability and connection. I pray um, continued vision and understanding for this whole body of Christ. God, be with us today. Thank you for your presence and your love. Thank you for seeking us, seeking our hearts um, to the point where we can understand and how to love again, you and others, ourselves, even more and more authentically. God, thank you so much. Amen. All right, I bless you today. Go in peace.